Okay, so now I'm excited to turn this over to my co-chair, Betsy Bush from Spongetta's Garden. She is sort of our um, cut flower muse here in the county, even though she's you're in Herkimer, right? Officially? Yes. Okay, yes. she's up in Herkimer County, but she's been supporting cut flower farming here in Delaware County. And so she is gonna introduce our speaker. So as we put to this together, we just wanted to look at like a journey of cut flowers and how we can grow them best here. Um, we are so excited to have Michael um, as he does talk about his experiences going from a florist to a farm, working with florists and ending up now as he is at Harris. But the coolest thing is he has no greenhouse. So he's gonna give us strategies for how do we grow cut flowers without growing our own transplants. So I'm really excited for this. Take it away, Michael. Good morning, everybody. Um, as, thank you, Betsy. Um, as she had said, I'm, uh, the short story is I'm a crazy flower person. Um, I've, since I was in high school, I've loved flowers. I kind of fell into um, a little quick history. Um, I fell into flowers, not realizing I was going to be into it. I was at uh, BOCES program for conservation. Nobody wanted to do the greenhouse. So Michael's like, eh, I'll do it. So I did it. And then my teacher was out on maternity leave and was like, you're doing flowers for an event and told me over the phone what to do, ordered all the flowers for me. And then I, I'm sure they look quite delicious. Um, I wish I had photos, but um, right then and there, I kind of fell in love with flowers. So I've kind of been around different parts of the industry. Um, I went to college for horticulture, greenhouse management at Morrisville. Um, stayed and did some floral design stuff there as well. Um, after that, I worked in retail, wholesale florists, um, got a gig as a salesperson at Harris. Um, I was there, I was in that role for five seasons, moved to web marketing. And while I was in web marketing, I also had my own cut flower farm um, for those two years and then left for my own flower farm um, just to do that. Um, and so that's kind of the start. And then I came back to Harris when they offered me the position as ornamentals product manager, which is my current role. Um, and my gig there is to just find new products, um, see what's changing in the marketplace. Um, one of my big goals with going back was really to try to uh, introduce more cut flowers um, to the program, as well as look at some plants a little differently um, than how some of our breeders even look at them. Um, and I'll talk about a little bit of that as we go forward. Um, but we can uh, move ahead. Thanks. One second. Oh, sorry. I guess I forgot I had that that screen. Um, one more, please. And that picture, I look much younger. It's because it was when I was farming. So I haven't been farming for a few seasons. Um, but at Harris, we do have trials gardens. So we've got about two acres here. Um, not all of it is in production, but in the back where we do uh, bedding plant trials, but a big piece of it is cut flower trials. Um, and we do some offsite as well. Um, so I imagine there's some of you on here that are vegetable farmers moving over, thinking about moving over, growing some flowers. Um, there'll be some that are just cut flowers. I always kind of start off with the, uh, um, well, I guess, let me go back, sorry, I'm kind of moving on too fast. Um, so the big part of this is to kind of talk about why, what to choose for your farm, how to choose it. Um, I know from being a farmer, looking through catalogs, everything looks so enticing and beautiful in the photos, um, but it doesn't mean it's gonna work on your farm or gonna sell at your market. Um, so the big thing I always really like to talk to people about at the beginning of a conversation is, um, you really need to research your market. Um, now with the whole COVID, um, the marketplace is very different than what we all are used to. Um, so that's kind of changed it. Um, even florist, it's a whole new world for them. Um, so when I was farming, I did, um, part of it was farmer's markets. Um, I did do a roadside stand. Um, we, had, we did not do any U-cut. Um, the big part of my business the first two years was actually um, subscription, so CSA type. Um, and then I also sell, sold buckets of flowers. 
um, for weddings. The first year, and again, this was back when there wasn't as many cut flower farmers. Um, I had 16 weddings in my first year just doing buckets of flowers. Um, so, so, that, so really figure out what kind of market uh, you wanna go after. Sorry, I froze for a moment. Um, we can move on. And then, so I'll start, there's different ways of growing. Um, another thing, once you kind of figure out what marketplace you wanna to go to, or you just wanna try and see how you do with cut flowers, um, start small, start simple, it's so important. Um, I know my first season, I had over, I wanna say, probably 60 different species I was growing, which can be a little intimidating. Um, and you, the thing with that is you will learn what works well for you and your location, um, but also you can't really focus on any particular item. Um, so first what we'll talk about as a beginning grower, um, some easy to grow varieties. Uh, direct sow is probably most important for many people. Um, as we mentioned, uh, or as Betsy had mentioned at the beginning, um, not having a greenhouse. Um, when I farmed, I did do a little bit. I had a 16 tray light stand that I made. So I did a little bit that I started myself, um, but I really relied a lot on direct sow items and then just getting plugs and liners um, from growers who it's their gig to start the plants. Um, so we'll start more, we'll talk more about the direct sow items. Um, we can move on. Um, so direct sow items. So the little snippet below where you see that earthway cedar, um, it's more sunflower focused. But so some of the direct sow items um, that I would go with and I did when I farmed amaranthus. Um, amaranthus is a huge producer. Um, pinch that at nine to 10 inches and you'll have a great production for most of the season. Um, of course, succession planting will help. Uh, Agrostema is a fun one. There's lots of different types of asters. Um, Calendula is a quick crop. Um, Carthamus is one. Um, on my particular property, I didn't have good success with Carthamus for some reason. Um, it always produces well for us right at Harris. Um, so that's a, that's a nice one. Celosia, I've got it here as direct sow. Um, I direct sowed it on my farm. Um, certain varieties that are quicker, it works well in our area where it, it, we don't have quite as long as the season as some. Um, transplanting is another option. Um, you will find many times with celosia, it'll seed itself. So next season, you will have some more lovelies from it. Um, Centuria, Cosmos. Um, Cosmos is an interesting one. The blooms themselves do not last very long, uh, probably on average around five days. Um, when I grew it on my farm, and I really recommend it as a foliage plant, um, it really fills out a bouquet if you're doing roadside stands or farmer's markets where you're making bouquets for people. Um, if you pick it when it's still in bud, uh, those blooms will still open. Um, if you are a grower and one part of your business is doing wedding flowers um, or the buckets or where you're producing bouquets and stuff, um, Cosmos can be good because the flowers really only need to last the day of the wedding. Um, so if you're getting the flowers to them in buckets the day before the wedding, um, they will, the blooms will last just fine. Um, so that's something to keep in mind as we talk through some of these different uh, species or genera, um, as well as the different uh, varieties. Um, and as we get to the end, we can talk more about particular varieties. And I'd really love as we go through, if you guys have questions about particulars, um, I can give you, tell you some of my favorites. Um, but so Cosmos, uh, Gypsophila. Uh, so this is one that is a love hate for many people who are in the floral industry. Um, baby's breath is the common name of it. Um, you either love it or you hate it, I kind of feel. Um, the perennial type is the type that most people are familiar with. Um, I've grown both of them. Um, honestly, I'm not a huge fan of the perennial type or what you can get through the wholesale trade because 
it smells like cat pee. Um, uh, just not fun. Um, so I highly recommend checking out, sorry, that was a weird one. Um, but the, I highly recommend looking at the annual varieties. Um, they look very different than the, the perennial, um, but they just look delicious. Um, they're nice and fluffy still. Um, definitely an easy to direct sell. We did some in our garden at Harris this last year to get some new photos um, and they're quick and easy. Um, quite fantastic and some people who are against uh, Gypsophila will change their minds um, like me. Definitely me. I've done, I've done, when I worked at Florist, we did a lot of weddings. Um, we were right in the middle of the crazy of all Gypsophila weddings and it was it was a lot and just not not appetizing for me. Um, Helichrysum, um, herbs, there's lots of herbs that can be used for um, cuts, again, mostly for foliage. Uh, some people doing edible flowers, edible foliage. Um, they can, you can kind of link the two together. Um, larkspur, the larkspur, and I don't have, I guess I didn't put sweet peas on this list, um, are two items that are direct so. Um, but they're cool season crops, so they got to be planted much earlier than the rest of these items. Um, and that's something we can talk about a little bit later on. Um, and one thing I will reference to there, actually, we'll come back to that. Um, so next for uh, nigella. Nigella is a really cool item. Um, it's something where you can use it for its flowers. They tend to be blue, purples. Uh, there are some cool yellow ones as well, the transformers. Um, but the other cool thing about them is you let them go to, to uh, bleh, seed and you have these really cool pods. Um, that's something I tended to be known as the weirdo, um, adding weird pods, um, different things to arrangements, um, just to give a little more fun to it and it not look so old school and in my mind, boring. Um, Orlea, Orlea is right up there with, um, I didn't mention Ami on here, uh, False Queen Anne's Lace. Um, they both kind of have a similar look, um, great Direxo items. By far, one of my favorite Direxo items, other than sunflowers and zinnias, would be Rudbeckia. Rudbeckia, there's so many varieties to offer. Um, I definitely recommend, I've got a couple pictures later on I'll show. Um, but I highly recommend taking a look at different vendors, Rudbeckia offerings. Um, great direct sow. They're another one. If you let them go to seed, you will have Rudbeckia for years. Our trial bed's in front of Harris. Um, we haven't planted Rudbeckia in, I think, three seasons, and we reliably have Rudbeckia every year. Keep in mind, this Rudbeckia is the ones I'm referring to, the direct sower, not the perennial types, usually. Um, Sometimes they will overwinter, um, and if treated like a cool crop, they can overwinter, but generally they just reseed. Um, these are, if anybody asks, or if anybody's looking, there's the Herta series, or Herta species, so it's Rudbeckia Herta. Um, that's the types that are more the annual um, that will, you can overwinter um, if it started young in the fall, um, but they're not reliable perennials. Um, Sunflowers. Uh, at the end of this presentation, I put a whole chunk on sunflowers just to see how far we get because sunflowers are probably the number one thing people ask me about, um, especially for new growers. Um, it's an item to check out. There's so many options um, and it really comes down to your farm um, and what you're making, what bouquets or single stem uh, zinnias. Uh, Zinnias, um, I'll show some pictures of those as well later. Zinnias are another one that are my favorites. Um, I've always looked at those as the easy to grow uh, dahlias. Um, massive producers, uh, very stunning. Um, and again, as I mentioned with sunflowers, so many options uh, from really tiny blooms up to the really large blooms, the Benares. Um, doubles, singles, weird scabiosa looking blooms, some speckled solid colors, um, the whole gamut. Um, so lots of great stuff there. And with the picture down below, uh, the items that I mentioned, the earthway cedar, this was what kind of made my life a lot easier as a farmer. 
Um, if you're doing direct sell items, you can go and put every single seed in by hand. Um, I did that most of the first season I did that. And then uh, I trialed a couple of pieces of equipment or cedars like this for Harris and fell in love with the earthway cedar. It takes a little bit to get used to, just especially if you have rocky soil, but I highly recommend anybody looking to do any direct sow item, um, definitely take a look at an earthway cedar. Um, and again, there, it's really meant for vegetables. Um, the, as far as looking at, if you go to look at plates, none of them will talk about flowers. Um, so I know we list some of the different plates of what are used for like sunflower zinnias. I've got listed on here, the beet plate, cucumber plate and popcorn plates, all depending on spacing you're looking for and the size of the seed. Um, but I highly recommend getting an earthway cedar or another cedar that can help you expedite your uh, planting. Okay, and we can move on from there. Um, so the next piece, um, I talked about a lot of the easy to grow items, direct so. So standing out at market, this is where I think about, you want your high value specialty cut flowers. Um, so many of these are items you would see in the wholesale trade, you'd see at florist. Um, but some of these are items that just don't ship well. So you as a local grower will have uh, great success selling them depending on your market because they just, the quality, especially coming from somebody who sold the florist, um, the quality that florists get of dahlias or well, dahlias and glads especially is very low quality. Dahlias just do not ship um, and they're not a long lasting crop or bloom um, out of water and shipping these across the country, they just do not survive well. Um, so, but when it comes to these, these uh, specialty items, some of them are a little more hands-on, a little slower to grow from seed um, or they, they just, don't do well direct selling. So you really do need to start them inside. Um, if you have the ability, like I mentioned, I had built like a 16 tray light stand um, to do some items that are quick to grow. Um, and some of the more difficult to grow items. Um, Lysianthus is one we'll talk about a little bit further on. Um, Lysianthus is one I've never tried growing from seed myself. Um, we did have somebody at our trial site, site uh, do them for us, um, as well as I tend to just rely on the plug and liner growers. Um, but we'll talk a little bit further about that. Um, so along with the, the stuff that can be grown from plugs and liners, which plugs are items grown from seed and liners are items generally grown vegetatively. Um, so we deal, we have five different plug and liner producers, but there's hundreds across the country um, some people will deal with local producers. Um, I did that my first season. I had a local farmer that did all of the trays for me, um, which is great. Um, definitely is marvelous, um, depending on what growers you're working with. Um, I tended after my first season, I went with the plug and liner growers. Um, in this particular case, they all were through Harris, but um, I've worked with some other companies as well. Um, and many of them, deal with other brokers too. Um, but the cool thing about them, these large producers doing plugs and liners, if I order a 285 tray or a 125 tray, so that's the number of cells that are in a tray, they tend to grow two to three of those trays to make sure that when the week that my product is supposed to ship, they have a full tray for me. So um, I, quickly became reliant on them because then I didn't have to worry about if I ordered a 125 tray that I wasn't going to have anything. Um, occasionally, obviously there's crop failures. We are dealing with live product, um, but the high majority of the time you get what you order, the quantities. Um, so that's why I went with plugs and liners. Um, again, liners, um, those are, I mentioned that those are items grown vegetatively. Um, there are some dahlias. Um, there's also some unique items that are veg vegetative, like some vegetative coleus can be used as a cut. Um, the seed varieties tend to not hold as well. 
Um, so some of the vegetative types hold really well as a foliage. Um, so that's kind of a difference. Like you see coleus in a seed catalog and you're like, oh, let me try that. Um, again, some of them will hold, not all of them, uh, but the vegetative tend to be better. There's an odd one. Um, some people love growing Cleome uh, as a cut flower. Um, I've grown it. It's just really sticky, messy, has thorns. Um, but there are some vegetative varieties that actually are thornless um, and don't have that smell and they're just not as sticky. So you can look throughout catalogs and kind of find items that really fit the marketplace or fit your needs as a grower. Um, outside of plugs and liners, the other pieces, there's bulbs, corms. Um, so lilies, dahlias, glads, those are the three that I'm most familiar with and I've grown the most uh, when I farmed and as well over at Harris. Um, glads are one, uh, nice and easy, you plant them. And actually glads and lilies, I would say, I've, I've always treated as annuals. Um, lilies, depending on where you're located, the lovely lily beetle um, can take them out. So I grew them for three seasons and the fourth season I gave up on them. My farm just had way too many of the lily beetle and I worked with another farmer locally to help supply my florist with those. Um, so, but lilies and glads, you can go right into the ground with them. You don't need to put them in any pots. Um, and the lilies through, if you're buying through the, the greenhouse trade tend to be cooled ahead of time. Um, if you buy through some of the home garden sites, they're not. So you want the pre-cooled, pre-chilled uh, lilies. Um, again, glads, Glads are a great one. Um, there's some really unique colors out there, some of the bi colors. I know from being in the floral trade, a lot of people look at them as their funeral flowers. Um, but some of these unique colors, I mean, even the solid colors I love. Um, and it all depends on how you're using them. Um, and especially if you're doing roadside stand, I went through so many sunflowers and glads. Um, just putting a bunch of five glads together and selling that, like it, they're reliable um, and people love them. Uh, dahlias are a little higher maintenance um, when it comes to the corms. Um, a lot of people will dig those up each season as I'm sure many of you have done in your own gardens or on your farms. Um, but again, dahlias, there's thousands of varieties. Um, the great thing with dahlias is I mentioned before is you can put out a better product than what California can ship or another country can ship. Um, so definitely keep your eye on the marketplace. Um, when I sold to florist, um, I did some dahlias, but I also worked with a couple local growers. Um, and I didn't actually mention that at the beginning. Um, when I, the fourth, third and fourth year of my flower farm, um, I did partial wholesale. So I sold my own product to florists, but then I also sold product for two other, two to three other growers and then some others as needed if florists needed product. Um, so I was the one going to florist um, and selling the product for them. Um, and with that, like the dahlias, it's, it's fascinating to see the industry we have in our mind when you go to a wholesale florist, you see everything, it's 24 inches stem length. Um, some florists will require that, um, but I know I worked with some high-end florists where I would bring them zinnias that had six inch stem on them, and they, or zinnias, sorry, uh, dahlias, and they wanted them. I remember one of my uh, farmer friends who had celosia, the heads were this big, where's my camera, um, like this big, but the stem was only this. I had, I, sent a picture to one of my florists that I was gonna be stopping to visit, um, but it was, they were my second stop. My first stop saw them and was like, I want as many of those as you can get. And it's one of those things like the head is huge and beautiful, but you think with a stem like this, what are you gonna do with that? But florist, florist, if they can get something unique, like most of the time they cut the stems off and they're doing, again, this is more of a high-end florist. Some of the, the older, more, um, standard florist probably wouldn't do that, but I also found when I was farming, those weren't my customers. Um, I wasn't growing mums. I wasn't growing carnations, although there are some really awesome carnations out there now um, that you could grow, um, but they're more unique colors. Um, 
So like the standard stuff you find at a wholesale florist, uh, more than likely is not what you're going to be growing. Um, and also they're so mass produced that um, you, you can't compete with price. Um, really what you can compete where you have the upper hand is uh, the quality. Um, your product it will be fresher, hopefully. Um, and as you get used to growing, you will le really learn what works best on your farm and what products um, will perform best for you. Um, thank you. Uh, so plugs and liners, uh, so items, definites. Adjuratum is a huge one. Um, they're just a small, delicate little flower if you haven't seen them. Um, they're like that blue, lavender, purple color range. Um, they're outstanding as filler um, and huge producers. I tended to go in um, after planting them. I would half of the row, I would pinch at like six, 12, uh, six to eight inches um, so that I had a little more staggered. And with a lot of the crops, um, you can pinch to get staggering. Bells of Ireland, uh, Solosha I mentioned below, uh, before um, that that can be direct sown. Um, it is something uh, that can also be transplanted. Um, with the Solosha, there's something big to keep in mind that there are some series out there that cannot be pinched. Um, so with a lot of the crops, uh, let's look at, so we got Solosha, the Campanula, uh, Snapdragon, Stock, um, there are certain varieties out there that are actually bred for greenhouse production, um, and they're meant to be single stem. So they highly recommend you do not pinch them. Um, some of those, you, I, I mean, you can still grow them out in the field. Um, I know many of the Solosha's, the Bombay series, which is kind of the breeders going away from and the Neos, the replacement for it. That's one that is a single stem Solosha, and I think I think there's another series called the Kramers. I think that's the other one. Um, those, if you pinch, you will have no blooms. Um, so definitely read the copy, um, read the packages, make sure you know what type you have so you don't uh, cause yourself any issues later on. Um, and some I'll just mention real quick because I know uh, many of you have probably heard of Florette Flowers. Um, she's out in Seattle or out in Washington. Um, she's one who's really pushed. She's really pushing the uh, cut flower market. There's a lot of gardeners, and some of you might be getting introduced to cut flowers from her as well. Um, so some Solosha that she's really pushed um, in her trials actually quite amazing. So I highly recommend looking at some of her information. Um, but like we've got the in the industry, the flamingos, the pompous plume, um, and now my name's drawn, or my head's drawn a blank, I'm sorry. Um, those are some of the, they're super crest. Those are some of the series you can pinch. Um, and again, you're gonna get a lot more production throughout the season on the ones you can pinch. Uh, the Neo series that I mentioned before that you cannot pinch, um, you'll get a great head out of them. You just, if you want those throughout the season, you have to schedule them out. Um, succession planting, and we'll touch base on some of that towards the end. Um, Campanula, uh, there's, a, there's four or five different series out there in the industry. Um, those are some kind of like I talked about with Solosha, but those on the individual varieties, you can pinch and get multiple stems from them or just leave them. Um, and then you just get one big long head um, or plume. Um, so uh, we'll come back to that. Uh, Dianthus. Um, so Dianthus is in the carnation family. Uh, that's a great one. The Amazon series and the sweet series are the two uh, that are most common in the industry, at least for local growers. Um, Amazons are cool. They'll produce in the middle of the summer in the heat. The sweets will not produce as well in the heat. Um, they tend to be produced a little bit earlier on. And the sweets are more meant for greenhouse production You'll have or high tunnels where the Amazon just do amazing um, in the field. Again, I've grown the sweets in the field and they do great as well. Not as nice as the Amazon, um, but they perform better in uh, high tunnel or greenhouse. Um, thing with, I remember when I was going to florist, 
sending out a price list and telling them about Dianthus. And they looked at the price of the Dianthus and they're like, there's no way I'm ever going to buy it from you. I can get it a lot less expensive at the wholesale florist. And then you show up in, like I tended to, when I went to a florist and wanted to introduce myself, I just took a few bunches of all the different product I have and gave it to them and said, just check out the product. Let me know what you think. Dianthus was one of those that I really sold people on because the quality of it, it was amazing and it lasts so much longer than what they're getting through the wholesale trade. Um, again, the Amazon series would be the go-to uh, for that. Um, and please, if anybody has questions, feel free to shout out. Uh, Dusty Miller, I'm, I'm not used to this uh, silence, it's weird. Um, I'm used to doing this in front of lots of people, so it's thrown me off a little. Um, so Dusty Miller is another crop um, that is grown throughout the world. Um, it does not ship very well. I know working at Florist, it's another one that comes in looking really withered. Um, and there's lots of different tricks to try to get it to come back. Um, but being a local grower, you, again, you have the best, you tend to have the best quality. Dusty Miller is a tricky one though. Um, I always found, again, if you have florists that are okay with short stems um, in the first season, you will have, you will do fine. Um, if they're looking for the really tall stems of Dusty Miller, um, overwinter your Dusty Miller, um, either in high tunnels or do some row covers. Um, in some seasons, depending on your exact location of the farm, um, the Dusty Miller could overwinter for you. The second season is when you're gonna get those nice tall stems. Um, uh, eucalyptus, um, right now there is a huge shortage of eucalyptus seed in the industry. So if you do end up going looking for these for, from plugs or even from seed, uh, you may not find them um, just because of all the fires in Australia, so huge shortage there. Uh, Gumfrina, Gumfrina is an interesting one. It's another one of those love hates. Um, we've got some different series in the industry that um, are standouts. The Audrey series is pretty common. QIS, KISS, some people refer to. Um, if anybody's wondering, QIS just stands for quality in seed. Um, but those are two of the big series um, and they grow a little differently. The Audrey's, it's more of a spray. And the Kiss is more of like a single on each stem. Um, so I highly recommend, again, based on how you, your farm and how many people you have harvesting, if it's just you. When I was farming, it was me. I was the one doing all the harvesting and everything. So um, you kind of just, based on your bouquets and the aesthetic you like, kind of see which of the Gumfrina types you like. Um, some people say that the, like the Audrey types that have the multiple blooms on it are harder to harvest. Um, but I like that look where you have multiple blooms coming off. So I took the time and honestly with Gumfrina, it's one of those ones I tended to just chop the whole plant and then break them apart for the bouquets. Um, herbs, we mentioned, um, in direct sow, there's lots of options. Uh, some plug and liner herbs, you're looking at lavender is the one I get the most calls about. Um, there's hundreds of varieties. Um, again, lavender is a difficult one, um, depending on your soil type. They do not like wet feet. So if you have, if you have any locations that are super wet, do not even, I wouldn't even try them. Um, but I would test out your location with small quantities first with lavender. Um, one of my favorite filler herbs, um, well, mint is one. Again, that can be iffy on your farm. You can decide whether or not you want to punish yourself later on with that. Um, but sage, actually. Sage is beautiful. Um, I've always loved it as an ornamental plant itself, um, but it's a great item to fill, fill out bouquets. Ornamental kale. I love me some ornamental kale. Um, the Crane series is by far one of my favorites. Um, ornamental kale, I remember when I was farming, um, having a ton of that right at the end of the season. Um, it was the last thing I had available to sell because again, I did not have greenhouses or high tunnels. Um, and I like the cool weather. They actually, if you're growing ornamental kale and you expect any color change, 
does not happen until you reliably have uh, night temperatures in like the 50, 55 degree uh, points. Um, but ornamental kales, I remember I had some that were really small and people thought they were roses when I had them in bouquets. Um, so there's a lot you can do with those. Um, I, I know people who are doing row covers on them to hold them through Christmas. Um, again, row covers are a great way to extend your season without having to put in all the money to do a high tunnel or a greenhouse. Um, ornamental peppers, there's lots of different options out there. Um, there are two items that I, I actually trialed this last season. I've grown them both in the past, but I've never grown them at the same time. Um, ornamental pepper, uh, pumpkin on a stick, and then the eggplant, and now I'm forgetting the names, I'm sorry guys, one second. So pumpkin on a stick is actually an eggplant, and then pumpkin pepper is, a, is more in the pepper family. Um, those are two that I thought were great. Um, I enjoy them. The pumpkin on a stick is one I would do more for fresh. Um, pumpkin pepper is the one that I would look at for dried. Um, they just have very different looks to them. The pumpkin pepper actually looks like a pumpkin. Um, and the other nice thing about the pumpkin pepper is it doesn't have thorns. That was why I hated, originally hated the pumpkin on a stick. Um, but two items that are fun for the fall ornamental trade, if, if you're a vegetable farmer and you're doing pumpkins, ornamental peppers, ornamental kale, those are items that definitely do and sell right along with your pumpkins, um, either potted or definitely as cuts. Um, they're, they do very well. Um, snapdragons. Um, snapdragons are gonna be similar to Solosha where there's some varieties bred specifically for greenhouse production, so they do best if they're single stem. Um, the Opus series, Potomacs, um, those have, are notorious for being, not notorious, but uh, they're meant for being greenhouse produced, but they've both been reliable producers out in the field. Um, some of the breeding companies are finally doing more tests on their varieties to see what, uh, how they do in the, in the field, even though they used to not recommend them, um, but crazy. Crazy flower farmer people like me and probably many of you uh, will push the limits on what can do well where, or it'll just look a different style. Um, when they were bred, they were looking for the super tall 24 to 36 inch stems. Um, you as a flower farmer probably don't need that. Um, so the um, Rocket series is has been around for many, many years. Um, that's one that's huge, reliable, but you can pinch it. Um, the same with the Potomacs, the Opus, I've pinched those in the field, six to nine inches, and you get many stems. They're not as big and huge as what you'd get through a wholesale market, um, but they're fantastic. Um, I only, on those types, I tended to do specific colors, depending on what the wedding themes were for the season, um, because again, Snapdragons are cheaper at wholesale, um, but the Chantillys are the more open petals, the open blooms. Um, those have kind of made a name for themselves in the industry. Um, so definitely take a look at those and they, they smell delicious. They smell like what people think about when they used to get bouquets back in the day, like getting that nice fresh smell, um, which is another piece of being a local farmer. You can offer scented items that by the time it gets delivered to a grower through the wholesale market trade, there's no smell a lot of the times. So um, it's one thing you get to enjoy. If you actually have the ability to do florist delivery and you have a truck full of flowers, that, that really entices people. Um, next item, status. Uh, status is a, a great crop. Um, it's probably one of the most used for dried flowers. Um, many of these items can be used as dried, but status is the one I see the most. Um, and it's just a reliable producer. There's many different colors. Um, stock, uh, again, falls in line with the Celosia snapdragons. Um, but along with snapdragons, they're a cooler crop. They don't necessarily like the high heat settings. Uh, they will not produce well. Um, so definitely use those in the cooler season, either early spring or use them later in the fall. A um, couple items that 
generally wouldn't make it on most people cut flowers list, but uh, again, I'm a crazy. Um, Tilinum, uh, take a look at that. It, it gets these really small pink flowers on it, but then it turns to nice little red seed heads. Um, they're tiny, um, but they're just, they're really cool looking. Another item that, um, and one of the reasons like I actually went back to Harris in this role is when I was in web marketing, I helped the product manager um, in trials and she knew my love for cut flowers. Um, and it was the year the hibiscus mahogany splendor was introduced. Um, that originally was meant for the bedding plant trade. Um, I remember having the, uh, somebody from the breeding company at Harris, we were walking through the trials and I'm like, I told him, I'm like, I've been trialing this all season. I've been cutting it and it is great as a cut flower, like foliage. And he looked at me, he's like, it wasn't bred for cuts, so we will never promote it as a cut. And then I kind of left the seed industry for a few years, as I mentioned, came back, went to an association meeting, which I'll talk about the ASCFG in a minute. Um, and everybody was talking about hibiscus mahogany splendor. So it was like, it's fascinating to see us as growers, if we think outside of the box and I try everything as a cut and see what it does. Um, so I highly recommend it. You'll find as farming, um, I remember, uh, what is it? Sorry, drawing another blank. Um, but there's some weeds in your fields that florists will be asking for. Um, there's a type of cress that was really common in the cut flower or in the field that where I was doing my cut flowers in the hedgerow. And I had one of the florists say, hey, do you have access to any of this? And I was like, she's nuts. Um, but it was a weed that produced reliably and I sold a ton of it. Um, so we talked a little bit about bulbs and corms. Um, there's also in the industry, you'll hear bare root. Um, so many perennials are available as bare root items. So instead of it coming to you in a pot, it's literally, you're just gonna get a root. Um, they look dead when they arrive to you, but you, as long as you work the soil really well and get the roots in the ground so that it has lots of soil uh, contact, um, really loose soil, you can have great result with bare root items. Delphiniums, lavender, hosta, those are the three probably I have the most experience with and we sold the most um, through our bare root suppliers. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Uh, Association of Specialty Cut Flower Growers. Um, this is a huge recommendation. Um, definitely check out this group. Um, I remember when I first started my farm, somebody dropped me a note at the roadside stand and said, if you haven't already, please join the ASCFG. And this is outside of Rochester, New York, where I'm at. And she said, she was a flower farmer. She said what made her change or helped her with her business was joining the ASCFG. So kind of like the group today um, that all of you are part of, uh, my guess is you really like to share information. Um, the ASCFG has been going uh, since the early 90s, mid, yeah, early 90s. And there's a Facebook group where they share information, um, but they also have this bulletin board that had been going since the beginning. And it has all these information from growers throughout the country. Um, and now there's more people throughout the world using it um, with just all these tips about growing or in your marketplace. Um, so I highly recommend joining the Association of Specialty Cut Flower Growers. Um, they used to do, with COVID, I, I know they delayed uh, their meeting, of course, um, but they do every two years, they tend to do a big conference and then they do lots of regional conferences. So if you're looking to get into Specialty Cut Flowers, definitely take a look at this group. Um, it pays for itself almost immediately, the information you can get from them. Um, they also do a quarterly newsletter that's more like a magazine um, where they do trials throughout the country um, and different growers talk about those items and what are their favorites. They do, they, uh, each year they nominate like what is the cut flower of the year for their group um, and some favorites, uh, the Rocket Series, Snapdragons, uh, Benari's Giants, uh, Zinnias. Um, there's a lot of really common great items in there. Um, definitely a group to take a look at. Um, 
Uh, next screen. This was just, I put in here, um, these are specific to Harris, but there's lots of other growers out there, um, as I mentioned. So we, like we offer over 300 varieties of cut flowers from seed. Um, there's a lot we don't offer. Um, we'll be doing a new variety presentation um, on Thursday, actually. And as I was going through those, I'm like, a lot of the new varieties aren't even varieties new to the industry. They're just varieties for some reason we never picked up. Um, and so there's always, there's always more product out there. So definitely take a look at all the different seed companies out there and see the options. Um, and then you can take a look at the list of some of the other vendors that we deal with. Uh, but as I mentioned, like flipping through the seed catalogs. So the things to look at is the height of the plants. Um, again, depending on the marketplace, if you're selling the florist, you can probably go with some shorter stem. I mentioned florette flowers earlier on. She is selling um, tomato uh, stems. She's selling pansies. Um, pansies are not reliably tall, um, but they're one that you, depending on your marketplace, you can sell. Um, I've done boutonnieres with pansies, so they are very, very usable. Um, but they're not something you would think about. So as you flip through the catalog, definitely take a look at those. Um, succulents are another one. Um, the whole house plant market right now is huge. Um, succulents have been huge for the florist trade in the last five, 10 years. Um, people are, you basically, you, you take a nice little echeveria and you put a stem on it. You just take a wooden dowel and you put it on it. And now you have this nice cut flower that you can throw in a bouquet. Um, there's lots of options with succulents um, and different foliage like that. Uh, next slide. Um, I mentioned sunflowers and uh, there, there's lots of options. These are actually two of our mixes. Um, but as I mentioned, there's different pods out there or different unique foliage. Um, again, doing roadside stand, I probably wouldn't do these, but if you're selling at a farmer's market or you're selling the florist uh, on the right, there's those two sunflowers, the sunfill. Um, they do actually open into flowers um, and they're actually pretty cool, but they're, the petals on them are really tiny. So they're not like your regular sunflower, but the stage you see them right there is what they're used as to add texture to a bouquet. Um, so they're fun. Um, the, the fall colors there on the other varieties um, are very popular, but you wouldn't want to grow those for summer production or early spring production. Um, so definitely as you look through people's sunflower options, I know we offer, I think it's like 65 varieties. Um, there's a lot of options out there. Um, with those, and actually, can we go to the next slide, please? Um, sunflowers, again, I wanted to give you a little more information on pollen free versus with pollen. Um, so when you, you have options, when you go through the catalog, uh, selling wholesale, selling to florist, um, and even I almost, for the most part, did pollen free. Um, the biggest thing there is your customer has them sitting on their nice white tablecloth. They're not going to drop pollen all over the place. They're less messy. Um, there are pollen free that are branching. Um, many are single stem. Um, and you can see here, there's a little more detail about the difference between the pollen free and pollen. Um, but from a customer perspective, they're less interested in the fact that it's male sterile. They more just don't want to mess. Um, single stem versus branching. We talked about this with pinching some items uh, like Celosia. Um, the Pro-Cut Sunrich series are the two most popular series of sunflowers out there. They are single stem. They can perform with pinching, but not reliably. So they're, it's highly recommended that you don't pinch those. Um, some people test it out and they have great results, um, but again, they're not reliable as pinched. So they're a single stem, one and done, where there's lots and lots of branching varieties out there too. Um, so some things to think about um, branching versus single stem, whether it be celosia or a sunflower the spacing, you plant it in the field. So single stem sunflowers, I would be planting between four to six inches in between each seed or plant. 
um, and branching nine to 12 inches. Um, the branching just need more space uh, to fill in. So the difference between the two, like again, single stem I said are one and done, um, but you can fit a lot more in one space versus the branching. Um, so kind of think that through for your farm. Um, next page. Um, succession planting. So this, this particular uh, graphic is more cut flower focused, um, but I wanted to mention this today because, so here we're talking about sunflowers, you can plant every seven to 10 days, the same variety and get a consistent production throughout the season. The other option is you plant three, fri three, fri bleh, three similar varieties um, throughout the season, every 25 days, 20 to 25 days, and you will then get a succession, um, but not need to plant as often. Um, like here, I've got Premier, Sunrich Summer, and Sunrich. All the actual blooms, like if you go with the golds, look very similar to each other. So you can succession throughout the season that way. Um, so talking about this, this isn't just for sunflowers. Celosia, if you're doing the single stems, same thing. And actually just about everything, even zinnias, I highly recommend doing two successions throughout the season. Um, one, as soon as you can get in the ground or uh, do some transplants that are only like two to three weeks old at the most um, and get them out right at your last frost. Um, and then another one about a month later. That way, pottery mildew is an issue with zinnias. Um, the newer planting later on will have less issues with pottery mildew. So it's kind of, you'll learn as you go with some of these plants um, what needs succession, but really most items, even in our areas, need, can uh, give you a more reliable production with uh, succession. Uh, next page. Uh, vase life. Um, the number one thing I'll tell people is clean your buckets. Um, you, you can kind of read through this copy here. Um, this is more sunflower based. Uh, but cleaning, whether you're using bleach, something of that nature. Um, and there's, there's other methods that aren't so chemical driven, um, but definitely clean your buckets. That's what's gonna make a big difference. Certain flowers like marigold, sunflowers um, have very dirty stems and the bacteria builds very quick. So change your water regularly and clean your buckets. Uh, next page. And this I will just leave up for people to kind of look at, um, but this just talks about different colors throughout the seasons. Do we have any questions? So I just want to ask you personally, what's your favorite cut flower? Oof, it's so tough. Um, I would probably say my, my initial thought is always hydrangeas. I really, really love hydrangeas. Um, and there's so many different varieties. I've got in my garden here at my house, I've got 15 different varieties because I'm a little obsessed. Um, so hydrangeas would be probably my go-to. And that's one for people, um, they're easy to access. Uh, limelight is like the number one in the industry. Um, it's what most people are used to seeing. Um, so hydrangeas and then dahlias. Um, dahlias are delicious. Although I say that now and then my, once I, I looked at your face and I'm like, I'm saying dahlias and then I'm like, wait, rudbeckias. Rudbeckias are probably right up there with the hydrangeas for me. Um, okay, now just... we have tons of questions in the box. I finally found it. Uh, okay, so um, they wanted to know the name of uh, the woman in Washington. That's Erin Benzikin? Yes. And yes. for Florette. Florette. Yeah. Now. It's worth checking out her Instagram, any of that stuff. A lot of farmer florist or uh, cut flower farmers you see across the country have kind of duplicated what she's done. Um, the biggest thing I would say to keep in mind if you do follow her is to realize she's in a very special location. She can grow sweet pea a lot longer than we can. <laughs> we will not be so reliable with sweet pea. So you'll see some of her stuff. She also fertilizes very, very well. Um, a lot of people look at her photos and are like, she's only picking through 
and showing the good stuff, but she, she gives a lot of fertility to her product. So you will see, and you will notice like if you, one of the, one of the items we get a lot of conversation about is the scabiosa type zinnias. They like cool temperatures. They will not stay scabiosa in warmer areas. Even our area tends to be too warm for them. Some seasons I have great production with them where they look nice and scabiosa. Hers always look nice and beautiful, full scabiosa looking, but it's her cool seasons and high fertility. So don't forget to fertilize. Okay, and then Cicada would like to know how you made your florist connections. Did you just cold call them or did you have a technique? I, I kind of had an in luckily. Um, so when I, well, kind of. Um, so the initial, like the florist that I knew from when I, when I first moved out to Rochester, I just got, I kind of forced myself on a florist to get a job there and started working there then worked at a wholesale floor. So I met a lot of florists because I worked in the wholesale. Um, but then when it came time for farming, I did, I cold called, I just showed up at people's places. I tried emailing florist um, to see if I could set up a time to come in and introduce and nobody ever responded. So I just filled up a whole bunch of buckets of flowers and then I started visiting um, and just left bunches for them. And then um, you, again, when I had mentioned earlier on in the train, in the talk that there's your old school florists, they want mums and the old standard. Yeah. Right. So, <laughs> we've got a good one from Fran, actually. Hi, Fran. Question for Michael. When does he plant out his ornamental kale for fall harvest? Uh, July. Okay. And, and that would be as a transplant. Stems, right? Yep. Yep. The earlier you plant them, the taller the stems are going to be. Um, the thing with those is keep in mind, you want to peel the bottom leaves off as they grow up. Um, that'll help get a better rosette at the top and keep them from getting too big. Um, right. And I always did like a six inch spacing on them to keep them not so large. Oh, and then you can pack a whole lot. And yeah. Okay. The um, gum frinas, QIS, pinch or do not pinch. Uh, those you do not need to pinch. Okay. And then let's see, we've got um, any downside to packing Lysianthus in four by four spacing versus the six by six. Do you have any weed management tips? Oof. Weeds are my favorite. Um, honestly, <laughs> plastic mulch was my go-to. Um, that that really helped me um, with my farm. Again, it was just me, so I didn't have the extra labor to help um, where I was able to weed some, but being a one-man show, it was very difficult to, to get in there and weed regularly. I know at Harris in our trials, um, we have a team of people and we still can't keep up with weeds many a time. So uh, Do you just- recommend the use of landscape fabric, like the Sunbelt, or you use that, or you just mostly tell and- Keep going. I did. I did both. Um, so I, I did do some landscape fabric. Um, I tended to use. I actually bought some of the the plastic mulch, and we use it at Harris. Um, that already has a six, like holes every six inches, so you don't have to worry about doing the holes yourself. Um, that was the easiest and quickest for me. Um, some of the direct sew items aren't so easy to do, so of course you'll wanna. Um, you'll just keep hilling or go through with the weeder. Um, there's different walk behind weeders that you can use, um, but get to the weeds when they're tiny. Otherwise it's too late. Okay, and then Timothy says he likes to mix and cut them, um, flower annuals into his perennial beds, but he's worried about varieties that will self so aggressively and start to take over. Do you have any recommendations of what not to plant in with his perennials? Celosia, definitely. Celosia, Rudbeckia. Um, again, if you were, Celosia, either way, Rudbeckia, if you are reliably cutting them and harvesting them so they don't set to seed, you'd be fine. Um, Celosia, though, the Talinum I mentioned, um, again, it's not that commonly grown. That's another one. You have it, you will have it for years. Um, those are probably the two standouts for me that you will have. 
Okay, and then um, Annika would like to know how small of seeds can you plant with the earth seeder? And how do you control weeds with direct seeding, which we're talking about? So small. Um, I've, I've done some of the, the stuff that's dust. Well, ten, it tends to be any of the stuff that's like dust, you can't direct sow anyway. You have to um, transplant those. But I've, I've done really tiny seed. I mean, it's, there's 12 different plates, so you can get quite tiny with it. Um, the hard part is, is the tinier the seed, the more seed you need for it. Um, otherwise, it just won't pick it up. Um, so I, I'm going to say anything I, anything I listed as direct so I've never had an issue with. Um, it's just getting the right plate for it. Um, and as far as weed control, another method, and I forgot this when we were talking before, um, I had a flame thrower for lack of a better term, uh, that I would do right before direct sowing um, that help to kill the seeds that are on the top. Um, because when, when you do, like if you're using an earthway seeder or you're doing by hand, you are gonna manipulate some of that soil and bring up more seeds. So just giving a hit like right before or doing a quick till a day or two before you're gonna plant um, will make a big difference for you. Again, just a top till, not too deep. And we are on Friday having on our vegetable section a talk on alternative IPM, and I believe he'll be covering flamethrowers. Nice. They're I, fun. Yeah, yeah, blast them. Okay, here's a great one. Do mixed cut flower bouquets or same type flowers sell better at roadside markets? So mixed versus. So. I did a little bit of all of it just to see what would work uh, for my market. Um, this, the things that sold well single stem or just bunched as single types were glads, sunflowers, the bigger items, um, even dahlias to some extent. Um, but it's only those bigger items I was able to really sell roadside as a single stem or just as a bunch. Um, most people, there are some crazies out there like me that will love to just buy bunches and go make something when they get home. Um, but the majority of people just don't have the interest and or time and mixed bouquets. I mean, mixed bouquets, if I got rid of sunflowers, mixed bouquets would have been my number one seller. Okay, and so this is a combination of two questions. Um, if you're just starting out, what size space would you recommend and then how many varieties? Which, yeah, if you're just bare bones beginner. Space-wide, that would be, I, I'd have to think a little harder on that. Um, but if you were just brand new and wanting to start, honestly, I would just pick some sunflowers and zinnias. Um, those are good reliables. If you can make it past those, then slowly start adding in other items. Um, again, the go-tos for the sunflowers would be the Procut Sunrich for me, um, the single stem types. Uh, and then the Zinnias, the Benares Giant, and the Queenie series are, and Oklahoma's, sorry. The, the Benares, the Oklahoma's, they're both those double, beautiful double blooms that almost look like dahlias. And the Queenies are too, but the Queenies are a little more unique colors. So. Great. And then uh, somebody wanted you to know that they did not find it useless, that they're in their fifth year of growing, and it was great. And there are a lot <laughs> of really nice compliments coming through. Thank you. So, yes. Okay. And then, um, you know, if everybody wants to, if anyone needs to go, feel free. We've got so many good questions here. And if Michael's willing to stay, I'm going to work in a few more. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's see. Larkspur, are those single or something that'll give you multiples? It depends on the series. Um, I've always I've always treated them more for single stem. Okay. Again, if you're in an area that's cooler, which we're we're like we have the summer heat, so as soon as the heat starts coming in, the larkspur's done. So it's hard in our areas to get a second cutting out of them, unless it's a really short spindly stem. Okay, and here's one we all wonder about. Any recommendations for overwintering and wintering dahlias? Good luck. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, even high tunnels reliably people don't 
have success. So unfortunately, um, in the ground, you're not going to have have too much success in our areas. But then you um, bring them in though, right? And then yep. store them. Yeah, so digging them up, um, I've always just dug them up and put them in the, you know, the old black bulb trays. I think I know them as bulb trays, but they're just black trays that have holes on the sides and on the bottom. I've always dug them up, let them dry out for a day. Um, so they're not moist and break a little bit of the soil off, but not wash them off, put them in those trays. And then I had like it either in a basement or a cool barn that doesn't freeze or garage um, or someplace that doesn't freeze um, that you can store them. And I've always had good luck that way. Um, if you are getting into dahlias though, there's so much information out there for dahlias. Um, I even just looking at some YouTube videos because there's other more specific ways people do it where they're cutting them all in the fall um, and labeling them all. I never got that detailed. Um, I just put them into buckets based on the color and let them sit through the winter and have always had good luck. Okay. As long as you don't wait too long and they freeze in the ground. Another one on pinching. Do you pinch Lysianthus? Um, yes. Um, so Lizzie's an interesting one. So you can, I've done both ways. Um, and there's different ways people look at Lizzie because um, most of the varieties will produce multiple blooms per stem. Um, I tended to, so I wouldn't do an initial pinch, um, but what I would do is when they're starting to get ready to bloom is pinch the first bloom um, so that those other blooms that are on those stems will bloom right at the same time. So that's what, and that necessarily wouldn't be considered pinching, it's more deadheading, um, but that's what I would do um, and get more reliable lysianthus. Um, and I've had in our high tunnels at Harris where once we've gone and we harvested them, um, we left them in and we got a second harvest later on in the season, so. Super, okay. Lads that have overwintered several years, do they become too crowded? This person has five rows, 150 feet long that have been overwintering for years. Um, wow. My issues are weeding and smaller flower size. They're definitely not in our zone because we can't overwinter yeah. at all. <laughs> <laughs> Although we can bring them in certainly. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Um, definitely any bulbs, perennials, any of those, if you can divide them and separate them, they'll produce better for you. So just like I would say, if, if you're able to overwinter dahlias, um, definitely it'd be in the same role as these glads. If you can dig them up and split them, um, you'll have a more reliable harvest. Okay, and I'm gonna do one more for you, and this is a toughie, um, recommendations for fertilizing. So I, I tend to cheat on this one. Um, I always go to the breeding company's websites because um, every crop is so different. Um, if, if you, if you want to specialize in a specific crop, I would go and find the breeding company's cultural details. Um, that, that's always my go-to. Um, so it's all over the place because there's, there's not one form for an entire farm. As far as in my mindset, like you can't just fertilize the same for a dahlia that you would for a zinnia. And did you um, use compost or organic fertilizers, inorganic? A combo. Um, I always tried, I did do some cover crops um, and it was mixed what we did. Uh, and we, dahlias, we always did a lot of organic fertilizer right in the ground right before we uh, planted. Um, but the rest, it was mostly all some organic um, fertilizers where, again, I, I, this is where I cheat and I go to the, the, the breeding companies to get the most reliable on that. Okay, and I am going to sneak one more in there. That's fine. Last planting date for day neutral sunflower varieties like Vincent Choice. I've planted them. So they're all, they say they're day length and they're like 90% day length, but they still have a little bit of issues. Um, 
I've with the Vincents, even the Sunrich, the Pro Cuts, I've planted those right up to where if we didn't have a frost, they would bloom mid-October. Um, so with I each of those- A little bit warmer than us because you have the lake nearby. Moderate. Yeah. Um, we get so, our first frost. This year it was September 16th. It was ridiculous. Yeah. So our, our usual is October 15th um, while well, in the city. So like October 10th is usually ours. And I would always shoot for a planting that would hit the week or two after, just in case we didn't get it. Nothing to lose except for a few seeds. Yeah, like that was like, and this is me, like I know I work at a seed company, but the cost of seed, like the gamble of planting 100 or 200 sunflowers, um, depending on your market, for a potential market that nobody else will plant that last one because there's too much of a gamble. So I, I always planted right up to, again, just counting back from your last frost, your first frost date and putting an extra week or two in there. Great. Okay, so I am gonna go ahead and wrap this up. I appreciate everybody staying so long. You wouldn't believe all the compliments you've gotten in the chat box. So um, thank you very much.